Hey everybody, I want to talk about a product and platform that I absolutely love and our latest sponsor, Interseller, the prospecting and outreach platform of choice for recruiters and sellers. Whether you're doubling down on business development or recruiting talent, Interseller does all the heavy lifting of finding contact data, automating the email and follow-up process, and syncs all that rich data into 20 plus CRM and ATS platforms. Reach out now and get going on a two-week free trial and let them know you heard about it from Adam on the podcast today. Check out the link on the website. Appreciate it. Welcome to the podcast, where we introduce you to incredible humans who share their journeys with the mission to inspire you to harness your own inner tenacity to drive your life and career forward. And now, your host, Adam Posner. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the podcast live. I am thrilled to introduce my guest today for our marketing roundtable. We have some tremendous uh, executives here, and we're going to talk about their companies, what's happening uh, in their industry, what's happening specifically within their specific organization, and a whole lot more. We're going to start with, oh, my hand goes the wrong way here. I never know which way to go here. It's kind of like the Brady Bunch action here. Uh, (laughs) So we'll start with Eddie Geller. Eddie, welcome. Would you kindly introduce yourself to my audience? Tell us who you are and what you guys do at Tiny Beans. Sure. Thanks, Adam. Obviously, uh, a real pleasure to be on the show. Thanks for having me. Um, so uh, my name is Eddie Geller. I'm the co-founder and CEO of a company called Tiny Beans. Um, we're a platform for parents, on the one hand, to be able to capture their everyday memories of their kids and share it with families all over the world in this very highly trusted and private setting. And then through that experience, we offer them a whole range of inspirational content and products to figure out what to do and where to go and what to think about new products every day. Um, so originally out of Australia, I'm from Sydney and moved to New York just on six years ago, actually, with a wife and kids. So call New York home now. Awesome. Welcome. And you're currently in the city? Um, just north, live in Westchester County, but our offices are in the city. Excellent. Awesome. And we'll get to the return to office situations in a little bit. And I'd love to kind of hear what's, you know, the feeling on the ground with your employees and how you're handling that. I'm going to talk to all three of you guys about that. Andrew, welcome. How you doing? Great, great. Right, my name is Andrew. I'm the uh, co-founder here at Lunchbox. Uh, we are like a Shopify for restaurants. We help brands like Bear Burger, Clean Shoes, Wings Over, and many more with everything that's related to their digital ordering as well as their loyalty. So the apps, the websites, catering, and much more. Um, I mean, background on myself, uh, my family was spent you know 40 years plus in the uh, hospitality. I mean, working in restaurants, operating, owned. And then uh, my co-founder also uh, was the CMO previously at Bear Burger, and we kind of came together. Uh, I'm a developer for the past 14 years, so tech and restaurant marketing brains all came together, and we started up Lunchbox, and we're here to empower restaurants and help them take control. I love it, and we're going to talk very specifically about what's happening in the restaurant industry, the pivots, the challenges, and uh, sadly, some of the failures that they're facing, uh, specifically here in New York. I mean, what's going to happen with the heat lamps? I mean, how long could you sit outside under under a heat lamp? And how many heat lamps are are safe? And and we'll get to all that in a little bit. (laughs) Uh, Elias, what's happening, my man? How are you doing on my bottom left of the screen? Hey, uh, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me today. Uh, So Elias Guerra, founder and CEO of a company called Pop Wallet. Uh, We call ourselves a mobile wallet customer experience management platform. Uh, But really what we do, we're a platform. We provide software tools for brands and retailers to engage mobile consumers through mobile wallets like Apple Wallet and Google Pay. Um, We started the company a few years ago. The big idea is that these mobile wallets, they're a transformative platform, really enabling that shift from a heads down app centric uh, mobile paradigm to one by which people interact with the world around them. Uh, You think about the trends around contactless and people using their phones to buy things. You don't want to touch anything anymore. So uh, that's really what our business is oriented around, enabling brands to engage consumers in that safe and contactless way. Awesome. Thank you. And gentlemen, thank you again. And what I really like about this panel here is each one of you in your individual sectors is having a tremendous impact now during COVID. And I want to talk about the you know, throughout the show, throughout all my shows over the last eight months, we've been talking about silver linings. And throughout this show, we're going to talk about professional silver linings and personal silver linings. And I want to start with Eddie. Um, Eddie, I've known about your product. I've tested it. I've used it. I have friends that use it. And it's pretty awesome. And I think one of the core themes is connecting, connecting families. And now in a time more than ever, when we lots of us can't physically be together, and especially with older relatives and older family members, the importance of your product. So I'd love if you could share a little bit about the last eight months, growth, innovations and some of the challenges that you have been facing. 
Yeah, totally. Um, so like you say, I guess um, the Tiny Beans is all about connecting families. So be it you know, new parents, be it grandparents, family members. And as you know, they're all over the world, right? So it's a family spread everywhere. I guess since COVID hit, um, and I guess March, April, May, when the stay-at-home orders hit, um, then there's no chance of seeing family. Um, at least, you know, um, prior to that, there was some chance that maybe you traveled a couple of times a year. So with that, we definitely saw an increased acceleration of not only user growth, but also just engagement. Really, it went from fanaticism to obsession. I think when it came down to um, trying to just really, um, you know, experience these wonderful um, moments in life when times, you know, aren't so great, especially about your your kids, your grandkids, your nieces and nephews, et cetera. So we definitely saw, um, you know, explosion of engagement. And that's, you know, although it played a little bit, it's still very strong. We definitely have still seen really high engagement in terms of more usage within a given day, within a given week, um, as, you know, grandparents and family members are all over the world and they want to be able to engage in their everyday with their kids. And the other part of it is the content side of things. We've also seen great growth because clearly, you know, you're at home more. There's more challenges with figuring out the fact that, you're a parent, you're a teacher, you're a carer, and occasionally a husband and wife. Um, so all in the same roof, and you obviously work at the same time. So um, trying to support these parents at these stages, especially through COVID has been very challenging, but also very rewarding. Absolutely. And, you know, there, there's a ton of emotion that's missed. I mean, I could speak specifically. I mean, my kids haven't seen my parents who live down in Florida in eight months. And we, we live by FaceTime. I mean, FaceTime is one of these innovations that I think now more than ever has, it's the importance of it, keeping us certainly connected. Where have you seen like the greatest, you know, uh, innovation or, or pivot as far as the current tech and product that you had, you know, pre-COVID coming into, you know, the last eight months? What is something that maybe you already had? You're like, wow, I didn't realize how important this piece of the entire offering is. And now it stands out more than ever. Um, probably two things come to mind. I mean, for us, um, there's a lot of new product we're building that we haven't quite launched yet. So a lot of focus on content community, especially personalization. But ignoring that for a second, that's more into 2021. I would say that I mean, two areas we've seen the most, I guess, engagement, if you will. One is around we went from, you know, we used to have a lot of physical events on the site. We now have virtual events, right? So lots of virtual experiences, of course. I know that's obvious, but that's definitely something that we've seen um, strong engagement around. And the second around in the Tiny Beans app experience, um, there's a feature called flashbacks. So every day and every week you get the flashback of what happened, you know, you know, in the past two weeks, three months, six months, et cetera. That's been, you know, that's blown up. People love reflecting and sort love of the memories. Happy, this happy space, sort of reminding themselves of what they what life was like three months ago, six months ago, three years ago, frankly. So that's really blown up in terms of just a chance to reminisce, remind themselves of what life was or what life will hopefully come back to being. Um, and that's really been, you know, really highly, you know, um, uh, you know, um, attractive for the users and i think that will even continue into next year awesome that's fantastic and, and it's always interesting to talk to everyone who's leading a product and saying wow we didn't even realize that our product could do this or the consumers wanted this and you find an entirely new channel and revenue streams and it's absolutely fascinating andrew speaking of revenue streams you know let's i didn't plan that transition but, <laughs> you know it, the restaurant industry is fascinating. I mean, we'll talk about, or, you know, early on during the pandemic, I mean, so many were hit hard and then they had to innovate. They're like, how are we going to take, you know, our, our, you know, dine in experience and take it to our customers? How are we going to provide for them? How are we going to pivot? I mean, you look at Panera, I mean, literally they opened up, uh, you know, they became a grocery chain because they had the infrastructure and they were able to intake, you know, all these products from there, from Cisco and all the other distributors and actually resell it on a consumer basis. But we're talking about individual restaurants here having to pivot and change. And we saw some that, you know, really succeeded well. They were able to, you know, change on a dime and, you know, build out, you know, that loyal customer base and, and reach out to them. And others, you know, unfortunately failed. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about how your product helped these restaurants over the last eight months. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I could talk about it in the scope of Lunchbox as well as some other, uh, you know, initiatives Please. that we spawned up. So I think uh, one thing to look at here is that we're, you know, Lunchbox is a SaaS company, but we soon found ourselves, especially in the restaurant space, becoming a lot of like consultants, you know, like trying to help these restaurants to like, stay on their feet. Uh, a big thing that we instituted right in the beginning was uh, we helped them get uh, up and running with curbside pickup. Uh, we gave them advice on on setting up meal kits, right? Yeah, because you talk about Panera, they have all the elements together to you know right. sell all these components, um, uh, getting them up and running with alcohol, and <laughs> that was a certain in its uh, peak. Um, and then as well as uh, 
building a lot of new functionality. So we have this new functionality uh, called a pocket kiosk and where somebody can go and sit down at the table and QR code um, and the table number, scan that code, put table number, put it in, and then you can order directly from your table that way because you know, you're looking at how the interactions and everything uh, in today's day um, is much more, uh, it's going to be much less, right? It's going to be much more limited, especially when it comes to waiters and servers. So we want to give you the ability to order at your table. We added functionality to scan QR code from your phone. So that way you don't have to hand over your credit card anymore. Yeah. You just scan that QR code and you pay with that. Um, so there's a lot of pieces like that, as well as uh, we launched an initiative right at the beginning called uh, Help Main Street. And we did that in conjunction uh, with over 200 folks in the in the uh, NYC tech community, with uh, Stella Artois, with Eva Longoria, and we we spun this initiative up to help restaurants uh, sell, uh, sell, help small businesses in general sp- uh, sell uh, gift cards, as well as uh, be- allowing people to order directly through them. Because we know Grubhub, we know DoorDash, we know the 20 to 30 percent that they're taking on each order, and we want to be able to highlight, like, hey, listen, if you're looking to support local businesses, uh, this is the best way that you can. We have over 120,000 uh, small businesses that we collected with, uh, with the mayor of Hoboken, with uh, San Francisco, with awesome. the, the Chamber of Commerce, Denver, Colorado. Yeah. A lot of this. And I don't think people realize, I mean, I'm not calling out any of the delivery services by name, but how much of a fee there really is that goes into it and how much yeah. that reduces the margin. So while you think you're doing great, hey, listen, we're still supporting the restaurants by by having delivery. Go out there and pick it up yourself. Go out there. Yeah. And it. You're going to save them. You're going to add 20 percent to that, you know, to that uh, to that bill. And on top of that, you know, tip where you can, you know, tip where you can be generous there and gift cards. Gift cards are tremendous. That's putting cash yep. directly into them. Uh, and that's awesome. And we'll certainly circle back on this in a, in a little bit. Uh, Elias, um, contactless. I mean, you guys are doing this pre-COVID. How fast did you have to ramp up some of the tech that you had? And how much of it was already in play? And it was just a matter of kind of flipping the switch. I mean, let's talk about some innovations in your space. Yeah, I think the good news, good news and bad news is we're, we're kind of ready for it in that we laid the groundwork early on, maybe a little too early, you know, and I think that pre pandemic, our value prop in the market, it was a little bit of a novelty, right? And people thought about mobile wallets, like, oh, that's kind of, that's a neat thing. And we spent a lot of time in our early years kind of educating the market, but here's why you should pay attention and why we viewed it. Our thesis was that this was a transformative platform. And of course, we look across the globe, right? Asia, China specifically, I mean, people are using their phones to buy things all day long, right? That's just how commerce was transacted. Once the pandemic hit, you know, there was that initial shock. But then as people found themselves going to the store and going through that checkout process and think about your own consumer behavior, like you don't want to touch anything, right? No, nothing. You know, paper cash or a plastic card or touch that interface. And so this, what was a novelty became a necessity and really driven by that consumer need to stay safe and remain contactless. And so after that initial pandemic shock that I think hit all of us hit the market, um, we started to see a lot of inbound, a lot of interest from our clients, from productive clients. Uh, and thankfully, we had the groundwork a little early, so our business was ready, ready to ramp and scale um, as necessary. That's, that's fantastic. A couple of questions here. Andrew, we got a, a question from the, the crowd here. So, guys, just a quick housekeeping thing. Like, uh, you know, we get questions, and I like to pull them in, so I'll, I'll hit a little timeout and pause and engage the audience here. So, Anna's asking, um, is it better to order through the big delivery apps or directly with the restaurants, Andrew? What do you have to say? Yeah, so there's a lot of options here, right? We got lots of third party apps, but we have also a lot of uh, first party apps. You know, the, the big thing that I always say is if you really like the restaurant and you really want to support them, just do a quick Google of them. A lot of restaurants will have uh, uh, websites or apps of their own that you can order through, and sometimes there'll be no uh, delivery fees. They'll have loyalty programs built in there, like cashback incentives. Uh, it actually pays off to order directly from the restaurants, and they'll appreciate it. Um, uh, another thing is also if you are uh, picking up, up especially just just call it in call in the pickup order uh and then just pay when you get to the restaurant or you can pay over the phone however it is but in that scenario i know a lot of these apps they'll make it really convenient right to do your reorders but it, it's much more beneficial there uh and uh yeah and also talking to the restaurant you might find that they have their own sort of delivery services so it's always better in this scenario to, to order directly through the big delivery apps uh i mean that's not through the big delivery apps through their own first party apps so it might be hosted by chow now might be hosted by lunchbox might be hosted by somebody Awesome. Certainly, certainly appreciate that. Um, Eddie, you know, you're in addition to, you know, leading anyway, as you lead this company, you are also the people leader. Um, 
have you had to make some really tough decisions during this time? And as much as you're open to sharing, and this is for all you guys, I'd love to hear, you know, did you have to let people go and what that was like? So, so Adam, and we've been pretty fortunate that um, the business has, has been um, you know, pretty resilient through the space, given a digital platform. The other thing is we acquired a company called Red Tricycle in January. So we were very busy merging the businesses um, and operating, you know, how we're going to think about marketing, sales, um, product, et cetera. So we, were, we actually grew into um, and through the space and have been recruiting, actively recruiting. Excellent. We brought on a whole bunch of new leadership through May and June, did all the recruiting remote and onboarding remote, which is definitely a unique experience. I've never done that before. I've met them all now in the flesh. So that's always a good thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, the business, um, you know, thankfully for us, we're in a space that I guess um, presents opportunity and growth given we're, we're obviously parents and family, but also on the Tremendous. revenue side, we generate revenue through large brands. And um, you know, yes, we had some hiccup in some industries, but some really grew. So thankfully, we've never had, we haven't really let anyone go. We've we're actually still recruiting and have open roles at the moment. That's excellent. And I, and I see that you still currently have an open CMO role, right? Is that still? Uh, we just posted it literally yesterday. Yeah, and, well, and, and how's this? We posted it. And within less, th like as of this morning or even as of now, we've had 140 applications in less than 24 hours. Yeah. And, and it's really interesting, too, because it's a really tough time in, in any in this job market because there's so much A-list talent that's on the market that unfortunately had to get let go. Mm -hmm. And what it's doing is it makes it a lot tougher for, for average folks. Who are, who are unfortunately in this position too. So it's it, it's it's a real tough one for companies, but it's also very advantageous. If a company is in a position to hire right now, there's an insane amount of, of talent out there. So let me um, ask you a question, Eddie. You know, you're, you're, having the, you're having these interview processes and we all know this, and this is for all three of, three of you guys here. There's so much that you pick up from that physical connection in an interview, that body language, that demeanor, right? The, the facial expressions. You know, how are you replicating that in, in an interview, Eddie? Like, how are you getting that feeling? How are you getting that assurance? Yeah, look, like you say, Adam, it, it's tough, right? You don't have, um, you know, the physical interactions across the table. Having said that, there's still you know, your body language. Granted, it's, you know, a quarter of a body, not the full body. Um, but the other thing that, that uh, um, we're spending more attention, or we'll play probably more attention to, and we always did in the past, but the interactions between the interviews. It's not just the time face to face, it's what happens in between the stuff. Do they follow up? How do they respond? How responsive are they? How do they follow up with? What's their initiative? You know, so uh, there's another. So today, like you say, yes, there's great talent, but you really have to do more than I think just ta talent. I think you need to have the energy, the aptitude. You want to be able to be creative, think differently. It's not just about, oh, here's a resume and that's it. Because exactly. I mean, I tell you what, if someone, you know, and for people listening, if someone submitted a video of themselves for a minute, and granted, not all roles want you know to video themselves, I would watch the full video, and that's, I'll spend more time on a thing video than I would actually reviewing a CV, and I get over a hundred of them. Yeah, I mean, so it comes down to standing out. Be creative, exactly. I think yeah. people can be creative, and I think it's all about the individual to step up and try new things. Yeah, and and Elias, let's talk about the the people side of your business. Um, what kind of position have you guys been in? Did you unfortunately have to let people go? Are you hiring, furloughing? Yeah, I mean, both. So, you know, right when everything hit, you know, we had pilots going with three major brands that just stopped in their tracks, globally recognizable brands. Um, some of our other clients and, and pipeline were reading news about 30, 50 percent of the workforce is furloughed or laid off. So we did a little right sizing early on, uh, reduced headcount, and then we incrementally added a few other folks um, trying to smire cautiously, conservatively, um, but still grow so that we can support our business. Now, what's interesting to me anyway, is that the people that we hired were actually people that we had known pre-pandemic, right? One person was an intern that we'd worked with. Uh, another person uh, was a consultant that we had worked with. So we knew them, we met in person, we had an idea for their work. Uh, so that was kind of our initial little bit of traction then slow growth in there. Excellent. And, you know, have you hired any senior level executives during this time? Anyone kind of higher up the ladder? Not yet. No. And that's something that we're looking at. You know, I think a lot of us are going through this in real time. I love hearing, you know, how Eddie describes their own experiences. These are things that we're thinking about as we look now to continue hiring in some of these key roles. Um, and it'll be interesting to face that situation where hiring a senior person that maybe I haven't 
met before. I think things like reference checks, uh, double checks, yeah, the background checks, the you know, getting a sense of who this person is beyond what they can portray in a video or you know, a video interview or a CV. And Andrew, how much of your workforce was remote pre-COVID? Uh, I would say none of it. None of it was remote pre-COVID. Our our team actually um, grew. We quadrupled during the course of since the beginning of awesome. February. I mean, we raised our seed I round of funding right at the beginning of the year. Yeah. <laughs> it's so, not all doom and gloom, everybody. Like, listen, there's a lot of companies hiring out there. And as yeah. a job seeker, you got to do your due diligence and, and you know put in the work. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, you know, we've really gone through and expanded all of our hiring efforts in terms of, you know, communicating, you know, beyond like the Indeed applications or the website applications uh, through. So we, we've done actually some a bit of, you know, managerial and executive hires here, you know, our, our uh, sales director during the course of time, product managers, a uh, new onboarding CX person, uh, manager that we have joining soon. So uh, aside from, you know, uh, everybody else and, and you know all the you know, engineers we've hired uh, cx onboarding folks um uh yeah we've done uh, quite a bit of that and i think the big part about it is yeah you know one standing out um uh, certainly uh, the follow-up has never become more important right i think <laughs> during the course of this is that <laughs> like you had you, yeah you just had your FaceTime, you know with that person just eliminated now you're through a phone so you need to find different ways to connect and i, I definitely I, every person that sends me a, a follow-up uh, or even if i'm not even on the interview i'm not even doing the interview i have some somebody reach out to me and says hey I, the other day i spoke with randall and uh you know i left this you know impression on me and uh, i always appreciate that i'm like oh wow and then i, I follow up pretty, pretty often have you had to make any changes adaptations pivoting as far as the candidate experience so we've always had a pretty streamlined uh, experience. I think that our big thing was that since there's so many other, like since we were hiring for so many roles, uh, kind of expanding that hiring effort without being in the same rooms and, and and bringing all the folks in that need to be. And we went through a whole scheduling <laughs> conflict in the beginning. Uh, uh, okay. Definitely had to change a lot of those processes. But I think, you know, we've always had it as a uh, phone screening and then either a technical or professional interview and then culture fit interview. And I think the culture fit has, you know, especially uh, since we don't have that face-to-face -face interaction, uh, the culture fit with the, with the co-founders um, is is essential. How do you determine culture fit, Andrew? I mean, what are some of those factors? Because I mean, I'll take a step back here, and I'm, I'm going to say it. Like, I do not like that term. I don't like the term culture <laughs> fit. But like, it, it's kind of one of those things where, I mean, in my in my opinion, I think like culture, and it's just my take on it. Like, everyone in your organization is a thread, different colors, different sizes, different textures, and that's what makes the fabric like that's that's what makes a quilt and i and i personally think that you need to have some conflicting you know maybe viewpoints maybe like different you know opinions different like views on the world there too so you know how do you kind of you know is it more of those things that's kind of like that no asshole policy because what i talked to a lot <laughs> of connected, really that's what it comes down to like we want you know diversity we want so many different peoples and types like you know how do you judge that on an interview and if someone's being authentic or not well, I think the big thing that we did at the beginning of all this, uh, especially with all the hiring we needed to do, was that um, we sat everybody down, all the leads on the team, and we asked, like, what do you admire about each person that's on our team, right? Because we're trying to define the culture. We're, like you know, we're going from a small team to a large team to find the culture together. And we saw a lot of consistent traits in all the people that, you know, the rock stars on the team. Uh, uh, I think willingness to learn and their ability to grow uh, it's hand in hand, right? But uh, willingness to learn is, is probably the biggest attribute that we look there. And we try to see all the opportunities that like when we're interviewing them and asking them questions that they're challenging themselves consistently. Um, but also uh, they have an ability to collaborate, right? If it sounds like they're a one man show or one woman show and <laughs> they're just operating it, then like maybe that's not the right fit. Um, you want somebody that's going to work with everyone. And then also uh, proactivity, especially uh, kind of like, you know, gauging. We have a lot of questions we ask them with regard to like, how do they, you know, kind of see stuff, you know, before it happens. Right. Um, and, and, that's, there's a lot of those attributes. I think those are like, you know, kind of hard working attributes. Um, but I think a, a big part of all of it is like, we have a Sunday test that we constantly perform is that when we're talking to the person, it's like, hey, if I had to come in on a Sunday and and work with this person over time, am I going to say, ah, oh, geez, I got to work with, you know, John over time today. It's going to be like a more. Yeah. <laughs> or am I going to say, oh, great. John's coming in. Oh, we're going to go I like that. together. Oh, we're going to whiteboard a whole bunch of stuff. This is going to be a great time. And that's, that's a good that's, limit test. That's the what we that's what we do. Yeah. yeah. Eddie, you guys were were uh, awarded 2019 one of the best places to work last year, right? 
Yeah, I mean, in the um, in sort of a small business category in New York, absolutely. I mean, we spend a ton of time. I mean, uh, so, so so all the makers, she's a uh, head of talent happiness, talent head of talent and happiness, which is a cool title in itself. That's great. Title. But um, she, um, you brought all these brilliant ideas with her, and obviously we collaborate a lot of them. Like one of the ones that um, one ideas we have is welcome videos, and you can see them on our website. When someone um, we know is joining, we'll do a welcome video for them. And, you know, when we were all together in the office, that was significantly easier than all remote. So now there's a ton of like ready button screens when, when it comes to the videos now. But we do a lot of work around, um, you know, staff development, you know, culture, you know, um, engagement, you know, a lot about play and fun and support and, you know, transparency and a lot of the sort of the values we live by. And, um, yeah, I guess it's all part and parcel with creating an environment in which people are excited to come into as opposed to, you know, not so excited to come into so yeah we use a ton of those things and we live that every day and 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 yeah we're fortunate enough to get an award on us um you know a few years back on it so so let's go back to that word culture i mean culture really you know for a lot of people culture is is a combination of things it is a you know enjoying being in the physical office with the people that you work with the environment the feel the vibe the physical office space let's call it what it is some offices are really awesome to be at you have all the bells and whistles there too that make you feel good about being there and then you have the other side you have the belonging feeling valued feeling that your job actually you know makes a difference that you that you have a clear trajectory in your career i mean how are you keeping that all alive when we can't be together physically elias yeah. you're getting that same exact question so it's coming to you right now i'm ready yeah, it's a it's a great question. Um, I think it's something where you, you know you're trying new things all the time, right? So so um, you know so so we try a whole range of things. We did like you know some there's a tool called Quiz Breaker, um, or basically you know um, it's about learning about each other. Well, we had a we had a daily stand up where we all went remote. We did a daily stand up across the whole company, and then we thought, well, that's too many meetings. So we tried a ton of stuff. One thing that I implemented early, which we still have, which I love is a Friday we do a weekly wins and fails where the whole company comes together for a literally, you know, for a less than an hour and you call out your wins for the week and fails for the week. And it's a company-wide check-in where you get to share about what was great, what wasn't so great, and you get to learn about other people, what other people are doing or not doing. And there's some people you haven't seen for weeks and some right. people you haven't seen for hours, right? Um, and I think it's about just bringing together the, this uh, sort of a role in this together and we want to share, celebrate successes and celebrate learnings together. And I think that's part of culture, right? You want to be able to experience things together, um, whether it's, you know, a big loss, a big learning, a launch, you know, um, customer feedback. And I think how do you create that in a sort of a way in which that's, you know, live, livable beyond the hour you spend face to face time. So, yeah, I mean, beyond the slacks in the middle, which I'm sure everyone uses and the slack stuff. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, that's something that's worked really well. And we use a tool called, you guys probably know this is a tool called tacos. Hey, taco inside Slack. I don't know if you've ever heard of it where you can basically recognize someone by giving them a taco. And then obviously the more tacos they have, they can convert that to reward somehow. Actual that's something tacos. That works really well where people can just give each other sort of, you know, virtual pats on the back really, or calling them out going, Hey, thanks for supporting me or great win over here or whatever. And you have up to five to give away a day and that's blown up in the last, I guess, you know, seven, eight months and before, given people are remote. So I think there's a couple of things that we've done that's been good, but it's we're always trying to get better. Always, always trying to innovate. And Elias, let's talk about culture. Um, just to kind of backtrack and level set for anyone who is just joining us or not too familiar, how much of your workforce uh, was remote pre-COVID? Zero. And what was that day like? You know, let's go back to that. For a lot of people here in New York, it was around March 13th there. Let's talk about that day. What was that day for you? And let's talk about the decisions and the thoughts that were going through your head as a leader. Like, oh, shit, this is real. On, I literally got to flip a switch and take this entire organization remote. Yeah, I think it was spooky leading up to that um, because, of course, you're watching the news and you're talking to people and hearing what's going on and you hear about such and such companies already gone remote. And um, we were in a situation where it looked like this train was coming our way. Um, and then finally the building one day just said, go home. Um, but be ready to come back in a week or two, right? Yeah, we thought even... Memorial Day, then it was Labor Day, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right, I mean, it was like literally come back after spring break and then that turned into Memorial Day. Um, so it took us a couple of months. And you know, we've always, we didn't have anybody working remotely, but we've always been a, a multi-office company. Right? And so we were used to working in a semi-distributed way. And so I think that initial transition 
um, was fairly seamless, a software company where people are computers, uh, data in the court. Yeah, so the mechanics um, weren't too difficult, but we didn't invest in the remote culture because we thought we were coming back. And it was only until a couple months into it, we're like, all right, this is going to be around for a little bit. It was long term. Yeah, then we said, let's start changing things and, and thinking about what is it like to be a remote first company. Um, and that's that's a journey we're on right now. I think we anticipate being remote first. Who knows, right? I mean, through none of us really want to be sitting in an office wearing a mask all day, sitting six feet away from our coworkers. That does not sound like fun. Um, so how can we work remotely, uh, but in a way that still maintains uh, a sense of culture? Um, and we've done some things, uh, you know, and I'll say one of them, it's kind of counterintuitive, but something that's worked for us um, is more frivolous meetings, right? More, more frivolous meetings. More frivolous meetings. Completely counterintuitive to the, to the if, if I don't need to be part of this, like end it early, don't invite me. Now it's like, hey, I just want to hang out. I just want to yeah, see you I mean, guys. <laughs> Some of it's purposeful. There's intent behind it, right? Where meetings where you don't necessarily talk about work, right? That frivolity that happens within um, the four walls of an office, right? That's where people build bonds and they start to like people. And I think when you like the people you're work with in your environment, good things are more likely to happen. So how do you work in a distributed environment? And, and having a meeting where we just talk about topics like, you know, who's your what's your favorite Nick Cage, right? All the Nick Cage movies. Who's your favorite Nick? cage, right? Uh, who would you want to hang out with a historical person dead? Who would you want to hang out with? That has nothing to do with mobile wallet. It's a lot of like the icebreaker conversation starters getting to know. Actually, I hear a lot of companies, people are getting to know each other more because they're spending more this time. That's exactly right. That's and knowing people's weird entertainment consumption habits <laughs> and judging them based on those habits, right? Yeah. I mean, like, what I, I, like, your housewife is below deck. What's your problem, man? I like below deck. You got a problem with that? And like, people are, people are crazy. Yeah, I love exactly it though. Right. No, that's awesome. And Andrew, here, here's an interesting one. How many, you know, out of your, how many, how many folks are in your organization? Uh, just past the 50 mark, I believe. Awesome. And what would you say that percent breakdown is roughly back in napkin or folks that are in like their first five years of their career? Uh, roughly just kind of well, probably more than half. More than so, half. so here's an interesting one. And I, and I want you guys, I'd love all of your perspective on this. And Andrew, like I, I have this, this, more than a hypothesis, I really truly believe that folks younger in their career really need to be in that physical office space to help them, you know, really lay that foundation, accountability, you know, visibility with senior management, the ability to learn, you know, from other folks within the organization or more senior, how they interact, their body language, how they engage with senior executives too. How are you seeing those younger folks on your team perform right now? Are you seeing some of them accelerate, some of them struggle, some of them who really do need that accountability? What are your thoughts here? Yeah, well, I think it's the the big thing, right, of um, following that herd. Like uh, when you're in the office and let's say there's some big meeting, you, you're seeing everybody getting up, you're seeing everybody go, and it kind of like it's that trigger and you build that mental habit, right? Where opposed to like you have a lot of new folks coming in and uh, maybe they're missing meetings and because <laughs> they haven't built that habit yet. And so, uh, yeah, definitely, I, I mean, when we look at uh, all the folks that are on our team, uh, whether they're new or old, I think there was definitely a... a a uh, habit that they needed to break into, which I think, you know, at, at this point, everyone's kind of built their habits and they figured it out. And we tried right. to, we re reorganized our entire, and I mentioned we had those scheduling conflicts. We reorganized our entire schedule for how we handle meetings and everything throughout the day, just because there was, um, I think with the with a lot of the the younger folks on the team as well, it's it, you know the second that you have the opportunity, this is your first, maybe it's your first job, your first role, or whatever it is, and, and now you're entirely remote, and there's no commute disconnect, right? There's no, hey guys, you guys want to go grab a, grab a drink or anything together, you know, all that. There's no disconnect that, of, of that part as well. Yeah, so everybody is working you know, till 10 o'clock or whatever it is when they, when they were joining, we're like saying, Oh, wow, this is, uh, and with, you know, and communicating on Slack and back and forth. And we said, all right, you know, we're going to set some boundaries here. Uh, you know, there's no, uh, uh, uh after eight o'clock, you know, there's no requirement to respond to people on Slack. Right. Um, uh, you yeah. know, there's, the, the meetings that we put, we actually instituted uh, like a game night 
uh, game night that we have on Wednesdays. And we just need to tell people, hey, it's okay to goof off, right? Like, you know, because some people come in and they just go like dial right into work and they're going to send that like for the whole day. But we need to know that it's okay. Like, you have to put these breaks in your day. Like, at one to two o'clock, you're not scheduling any meetings. Like, you mandatory have to take a lunch. Like, like you know, go like, for a not, walk, get out of your apartment, yes, yeah, get out of your get house. Out, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, because yeah, because at the office, you know, there's there's everyone saying, "Hey, we want to go and grab something together." And here, when you're at home, like you can just dial in and and, and forget about everything. Before you know it, it's three o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah. You look especially down and you're you, like, "Damn!" Especially it's, in the NYC apartments without the windows, you'll you'll <laughs> never know. Yeah, I know it, it's crazy there. And and Eddie, I mean, this is an interesting one too. I mean, in the beginning, we saw productivity really soar through the roof. I mean, people were in it. They also wanted to show that they were actually doing the work, right? There was a lot of people that were like. All right, I got to make sure that I have visibility that people see I'm, mm-hmm. I'm productive there. And then we've kind of been on this productivity roller coaster. We get the work at home fatigue. We get the Zoom fatigues coming in. You know, how do you keep those spirits high? I mean, how do you keep everybody productive and motivated? And in the same time, second part of that question is Andrew hits on how do we ensure that we do have these mental breaks? Yeah, look, I mean, I think it's super tough. I don't think there's a, 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 a silver bullet here, right? I think it's also very personal, right? I mean, we had a couple of people that you know were um single relied on you know a very enriched social life and mm-hmm. that just died off a cliff right um, and they really struggled to sort of replace that somehow um and that affected their morale that affected their work and and the whole world really and i think that's a real battle and no matter what you can do and try and and replace it um they have to go through their own journey um whereas other people you know embrace it's like hey i'm going to go and live with my folks upstate and spend more time with them and save money on rent and and get the outdoors and go hiking and drink their alcohol and so i really think i think it depends on the individual um uh and uh and yeah i mean um one of the things we've definitely tried to do and courtney my assistant is definitely trying to do a lot of this is like Hey, it's a great, it's a great day out there. Make sure you go for a walk. Like just remind people because I think we get so busy being busy. (laughs) You forget to look up about the things that, you know, um, to make the most of the day. And now before you know it, it's going to be, you know, pretty cold here in New York. So, um, I think it's really been a mixed thing. And the other thing I'd say is that it all comes back to, I think the right person. Um, you need a self starter that is basically excited by the work they're doing, excited by the way the company's going and can align what they do with the company's ambitions, right? If you don't have that, the performance ain't going to be great, which is going to help. It's going to have a different effect of morale, you know, culture, communication, and then that's a negative, right? Yeah, absolutely. Elias, how are you as a people leader really ensuring that that mental health of your team, you know, how are you making sure that like you have some, some, you know, top performers pre COVID and listen, like this is, I, I can't believe this is the first time I'm using the word today in an unprecedented time um, where different things are affecting people differently, right? You don't know people's work at home situation. You don't know what they're dealing with. There's a lot of people that are living with their demons at home and, and work is an escape for them. I mean, it's where they're most productive and some people just logistically and physically, they don't have a good place to work the right way. But how are you, how are you checking in individually? How are you making sure that everyone on the team is like, you know, more than just saying, are you okay? Like, how do you ensure that as best you can? I mean, you're not a trained mental health professional, but like, you know, you've been around the block, you're a seasoned people leader. Like, how do you get a feel to make sure that everyone's kind of on the right track and doing okay? Yeah. I mean, that's something that hasn't changed in COVID. It starts with empathy. I think as a people leader, like you just have to, you know, be able to identify with or relate to what's going on. And um, a way you do that is by asking and listening and just trying to understand each person's situation. Um, I think what has changed is the willingness to just be more flexible. And I think that that's necessary in these times. Um, I, I think that uh, the distribution of the workforce in given different people's stages of lives, their personal situations, yep. at home, um, you have to just be flexible um, with uh, e- each situation as it presents itself. Um, but, you know, at the same time, it's not a matter of just like letting go and letting anybody do whatever they want. There still needs to be some structure. That structure um, ideally is oriented around an objective. And I think something that we've tried to do is just be very clear and transparent in our communication and what's expected of people and say, look, if you want to work the weekend, but you got to take Thursday off because you got to get the, you know, take care of the kids because they're not in school for this reason, do it. Right. Do it. And I think that uh, our team responds very positively to that. I think most people do because that's how you earn trust. Absolutely. 
yeah, beneficial for us. Right. And, and, and that's the word on the street right now. And when we talk about what the new norm looks like or what returning to work looks like, you know, the general consensus is there's people that fall into a few different camps. There's people that only want to work from home forever. There's people that would love to return to the office full time. And then you have people in the middle who really want that option. What it comes down to is trust. People want to know that their employers trust them to get the job done that they were hired for. And if the office is open, great. Have it safe, have it sound, uh, make it easy for me to come in. And then also give me the flexibilities and tools to, to work remotely. Eddie, what is what does that new norm look like? I mean, what are you envisioning? I mean, we're not going to put a date on it, but like what's happening in your company? Are you planning on staying remote? I mean, you're opening back up. I mean, what are, what are your thoughts on getting people back together physically? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so, so I guess um, we have an office in New York City. At the last Andrew, you're next on so, this. Uh, three months, we've started to go back on Wednesdays for the people that are comfortable. So it's clearly it's just That's awesome. voluntary, um, not mandatory. If you're comfortable to come in on a Wednesday, come in. And we have all the sort of, you know, the standard things in terms of checking your temperature and make sure you're okay and have all the, all the appropriate, um, I guess, aspects of the office to make sure that it's uh, clean and safe, et cetera, for the people that want to come. And it's been really awesome. I mean, I go in every Wednesday and, and you know, probably about a dozen of us that come in. Other people may come in on Wednesday and Thursday, some Tuesday. So um, it really depends. But I guess forward the clock in, I don't know, a year, six months, um, you know, be optimistic, call it a year. Um, uh, I would say probably be a hybrid. I'd love a hybrid of maybe a couple of days in the city, two, three days in the city, two, three days at home. And I mean, I, I'm really enjoying the efficiency of being at home. Um, but I miss the, you know, camaraderie and the culture of being in the office. And actually just going for those walks and grabbing lunch and chatting and showing exactly. and, and debating and stuff. So I would love to get to a spot where it's a combination of both. That's, that's fantastic, right? There's that, that I, I mean, I, I miss it. I mean, a little bit too. It's like people forget that commute. We all bitch about it too, sitting on the train, sitting in their cars, but that was our decompression time. It might be your time to, to watch podcasts, to, you know, to listen to podcasts, catch up on shows, read the paper, read a book, but you had that break. You had that physical break between work and home. And I know for me, for example, literally say I'm working until 6.30, literally 6.30 on the dot, I'm walking down the stairs and I'm right in kid zone dinner and it's like go time. And you're like, all right, give me, give me a minute here. Those three seconds walking down the stairs um, was not enough. Andrew, what, what does the return to work look like? What are you guys thinking about? What's on the roadmap? Well, I'll tell you right now, uh, when we went right at the end of March is when our lease for our, our office was ending, right? And we were actually mm. gearing up to move into a bigger office. But then when all this hit, we just canceled everything. So technically, we're homeless, right? Uh, but we're all, <laughs> our office is our homes. But it gives us a nice blank, blank slate, right? A uh, blank slate as to what we want to really do here. Uh, we're considering, you know, we have a lot of folks that, I mean, I'm from Queens. A lot of folks that are in Queens, a lot of folks that are in Brooklyn, maybe having two smaller satellite offices. Like hubs. Yeah, little hub. I've been seeing hubs. Yeah, yeah, potentially doing that. So that way we're limiting everybody, you know, the commute that they have to take into the city, um, giving them that opportunity. But there's also a lot of people on our team that saw this as an opportunity, like, hey, I'm going to move to like Austin for a year. I'm going to move to LA for a year. I'm going to move somewhere, anywhere in the Midwest for a year. Um, and so uh, there's, you know, adjusting for that too. Yeah, and I think there's a big difference too. And there's a difference between remote work and work from home. I think there, 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 there's yeah. a strong difference there. And I think that's what people are trying to understand. Working from home literally means sitting in your kitchen table, your home <laughs> office. Working remote means I'm still you know, doing that, but still in that different mindset there. Um, Elias, what is what does the future look like? Oh, that's the billion dollar question. Adam. I mean, what, what do you, I mean, what do you want it to look like? I mean, you're listening, you have your finger on the pulse. Yeah. What are your employees saying to you? What, what, what are you hearing? So, um, you know, we asked everybody this, do you want to be in an office? Do you want to work from home? The answer is yes. And <laughs> it's a combination of the two, right? A couple of days in the office where you can collaborate, you can, you know, have that face-to-face -face time, you can go to lunch, do those things. But then also right, a couple of days where you're just heads down, focused on the, you know, those individual tasks. Um, me personally, like, uh, that's the right thing for me too. Everybody to a T that we talked to on our team uh, agrees you know, the same thing. So. As I peer into my crystal ball, think about when is there a vaccine, when you know, going back to an office, a viable option. Um, that's what we look at is, is a hybrid uh, approach.
That's awesome. So if if any of you three gentlemen are a fan of the full audio version of the podcast, which I hope you are, and you could just shake your head and say it so everyone watching knows that people actually listen to my show. Um, there, there's a series of questions that I ask all my guests for about 107 episodes, because for me, it, that's my master's class. And I love to hear from leaders, their perspective on life and what motivates them and move them. So I'm going to go around the horn and ask a couple of my favorite questions here. Eddie, what's the single greatest piece of advice that you've ever received that you take action on every single day? single biggest well well i got one last week so it's top of mind um so i'll share it um because it's probably so much in my past what you appreciate appreciates could you give us an example this so morning this morning you know a, a work colleague you appreciate a client you appreciate a supplier you appreciate yourself like you invest in those relationships you invest in you like all those things the context they, you know, the return, it's like the whole give get, but in a much more, I think, um, I guess, important way. So whether it's a team member you're investing in, you're teaching, you're coaching, if you invest in them, you know, you'll continue to get a return on that overall and they'll get an even bigger return. So that's probably, you know, a small thing that um, I'm thinking about more, um, more and more um, as I obviously we're building the company, building the team and, and making sure that everyone feels, you know, in, I guess, um, a recognition, you know, rewarded and more importantly, the fact that they're learning through that journey. I love it. Elias, if you could go back to your 30 year old self, which was what a year ago, um, and knowing what you know now, what would you tell your 30 year old self what not to do? <laughs> start, start a company. Um, no, um, what would I tell my 30 year old self what not to do? Um, you know, don't be afraid of taking risks. Um, don't be afraid of investing in yourself and going for it. Um, you know, betting on oneself, betting on myself is something that's always paid dividends. And I think the, my 30 year old self, which was a little bit longer than a year ago, was maybe a little bit more timid. Uh, so it took me a little bit longer to start my journey. Uh, but I'm, I'm glad I eventually did my entrepreneurial journey. I love it, man. Andrew, what would you say your superpower is, right? And we're not talking about flying. We're not talking about being invisible. But like, you know, what what is it that you do better than almost anyone on this planet that makes you special? Oh, boy. Uh, me special. Uh, I think it's um, a big thing for me, in a, at least what I've seen in a lot of my conversations, is uh, in as a communicator, but also as a technologist, um, uh, combining those two aspects is kind of something that's a uh, more rarity that I found in the industry and people are like, Oh wow. Yeah. A developer that knows <laughs> how to talk to marketing lingo, how to talk Shocking. to the business lingo. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So, uh, and that's your uh, unicorn. You're a true unicorn. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's the, yeah, that's the extrovert that I am. I get that from my family for sure. The gift of the gab. But, um, uh, but yeah, I think that, you know, in terms of my superpower, my differentiator, it's really, it's really always fallen along that. That's awesome. That's tremendous. And I want to end the show with positivity. I mean, I think that the entire, you know, 49 minutes here have been extremely positive. Um, everyone sharing some great stories, some successes within your organizations. And I want to continue that. I want to end on that. Elias, I'd love if you could share a personal silver lining and a professional silver lining that you've experienced, you know, yourself over the last eight or nine months. Jeez, eight, nine, it's a long time. Yeah, personal. I mean, here, I'm sitting here on the Upper West Side, right? Or, or New York. Um, personal, something that I love that's very positive, just eating out, right? Is looking at the transformation of our city, of the streets, and having, you know, the, the rumors of New York's demise greatly exaggerated. Um, so personally, like, I love that transformation and just being out um, and about. And then what, professionally? Like, yeah, it's this trend towards contactless. It's this, this next generation of mobile engagement, uh, people not touching anything. I think that bodes well for our own business. Are you grateful for the pandemic? No, <laughs> I wish these things could have happened uh, thanks to a different driver, but I think that is it's necessary. I think this is gonna be a catalyst for fundamental change, positive change going forward. I love it. Andrew, personal silver lining and a professional silver lining. Uh, I think the big personal silver lining uh, that, that I noticed, especially uh, with like my girlfriend, she went back into work for a day. Uh, I realized like, you know, having that, uh, that interaction where it kind of like, you know, uh, before 
you'd go to work and then you spend that time and then maybe come around around seven, eight o'clock. And then you're trying to like, just catch up on your day. Just kind of get to experience your days together. That's certainly nice. This also with our cat um, gets to walk across the zoom calls often. He hasn't done it yet during this call, Uh, but (laughs) he'll always make an appearance, which is this nice silver lining for everybody. Do you think the cat's happy that you're home? It's like, why is everyone home all the time? I had this this alone time. And now you schmucks are here all the time. and You ruined it for me. I'll tell you now that my cat is literally allergic to humans, like allergic to human dander. So uh, he's probably like, oh, man, there are guys are all in my spot. So, but, <laughs> yeah. But, uh, and then a uh, professional silver lining. I think um, this definitely what's happened here has helped us as a company get really close to our mission, which has really always been about empowering restaurants and help, you know, giving them all the tools that they need. And it's helped us in, in so many ways, like that mission has guided us during it throughout this whole process. And so like, all right, what are we actually working on during this time? What features are we rolling out? What initiatives are we starting? Um, because, uh, uh, you know, it, it's become so apparent for everyone in our company, how important our job is. Like when we see one of our, at the beginning, uh, everyone, you know, a lot of our restaurants that work with us, they laid off, you know, half, even more of all their employees. Right. And then all of a sudden they turn lunchbox on and then they're able to hire half of them back. And it's like, it, awesome. you know, you start immediately see the impact. And I think that's one thing that, you know, we're grateful for is, is to be able to do our part. That That's incredible. And Eddie, I'd love if you could share with us. Sure, absolutely. From, so from a personal perspective, um, just, I mean, the time I'm saving by not commuting, I would commute each way an hour, so two hours a day. I get to spend time with my kids, um, with my wife. Um, we have a little dog too. I mean, I had lunch just before with my 15-year-old um, and get to hang out and make lunch together and bread, bread, all those things. So Incredible. much more time with the family, much more time socially. Um, I've played more golf now than ever before. <laughs> Because it's down the road where I live, not you know an hour away. So um, definitely, just um, you know, so much more time with the people that matter. I would say um, that's been really amazing from a personal perspective. And then from a business perspective, um, uh, this whole you know, two things. One, I think as a company, we can be far more efficient and successful in this hybrid world, and I think it's proven that more than ever before. And I think we've had, we, we, we have been able to bring on board incredible talent because of COVID. To your point earlier, I think we've we had you know, A-list talent that we never would have attracted if it wasn't for COVID. And now we're, we're recruiting people from other parts of the world. We had this you know, top class engineer, infrastructure expert in Canada. We just hired an iOS engineer in Colorado. Um, and you know, we hired an Android, our Android lead is in, um, uh, is in Bosnia, I think. Um, so so um, it's incredible to be able to find the talent, and that's something that COVID has really enabled us to think about um, and get talent anywhere um, rather than only only here. Yeah, I mean, that's been another, another real epiphany is that companies, once they realize that they can operate remote, they're not just, you know, stuck with hiring in, in their specific locales in those areas, and they've seen the rest of the country open up, and there's amazing talents. Let's call it what it is. Sometimes there's actually cost savings. The cost of living is lesser, and you could get amazing talent for, for less. And listen, as business owners, that's absolutely important also in finding new and amazing people. So there's a ton of silver linings here. And I want to thank all three of you gentlemen for spending some time with me today and my audience. I know that there's been a ton of value, insights, and information shared. And I hope anyone who is watching this on the replay, thank you for coming back to us. We'll go around the horn here, and let's let everyone know where they could find you, where they connect with yourself and your company, and they could find more. Let's switch it up. Andrew. Uh, sure. Yeah, you can, uh, we'll find us lunchbox.io. Uh, feel free to go check that out. You can, uh, we kind of, we have like an Insta TikTok presence now, LinkedIn presence, Instagram and all that, but you can usually find us at lunchbox tech. Uh, definitely give us a check out. Awesome. Eddie. Yeah. Um, you can find us on our tinybeans.com. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, and, uh, Adam, thanks so much for having me on the show. Really awesome fun. That's awesome. Thank you. Elias, bring us home. Popwallet.com, or you can reach out to me, Elias at Popwallet, and find us on LinkedIn uh, as well. Awesome. What's Gabe asking me here? Where can we get some NHPs? Yeah, I'm opening up my merch store soon. I'm going to have a conversation with these three gentlemen here as my merch advisory board. There actually is some merch out there, which is crazy, but that's a story for another day. I'm trying to monetize, guys. I'm trying to different product lines out there. But I want to thank each of you. I know that you're all extremely busy, so taking an hour out of your day to spend time with me and my audience is incredibly 
uh, awesome. And I'm grateful for it. And I thank you. And I look forward to continuing my relationship with each one of you. And I'll follow up offline. Everyone following us at home, thank you for joining us on the podcast. Take care. Remember, wash your hands, stay six feet apart, look out for each other. Find us at thepodcast.com, LinkedIn, all those other spots. Take care, be good, and we'll catch you next week for another great episode of The Podcast. Wisdom is forever, but for us, it's time to go. Thank you for joining us. Luckily, we'll be back with our next episode soon, jam-packed with more incredible humans. Thank you for listening, subscribing, and sharing. To join the conversation, search The Podcast on LinkedIn. And to catch up on past episodes and more info, please visit www.thepausecast.com.